to share something that we thought was good that we saw one of the speakers do. Just one of them? Or, or you can talk in general. I don't want to limit your expression in any way. So. Okay. <laughs> so, go ahead. <coughs> I guess the first thing I noted is that they move very naturally. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is hard to achieve. Yes. I, I don't know how they manage to do it so naturally and so lightheartedly. Like, they seem very friendly mm -hmm. uh, towards the public. Mm -hmm. um, also, fluent speaking, which is obvious. Uh, no pauses whatsoever. Uh, good humor, lightheartedness, as, as I just said. A uh, clarity of speech and structure. A good order of thoughts. Uh, clear gesticulation. That's, that's my list. That's good. Okay. Uh, other good things we saw. Yeah. I think um, in some of the speakers, they made um, like personal ap approaches towards the public, mm -hmm. which made it like for some of us that we don't have a lot of experience, it made it very easily for us like to follow the debate, and that's good because you have to measure your audience and know who you're speaking to. So it, you sort of like get to everybody. And I, I, I share <coughs> the energy, the thought that they were very fluent, how they organized in the minutes. I mean, there were no pauses. It didn't seem as though they stopped to think what they were going to say. They just had so much to say. They were very organized in the way they said it. Mm -hmm. That's very good observation. Uh, other know, thoughts? Yeah. In, in the speech, um, they, they speak like with peaks and lows. Mm -hmm. And that really culti captivates the audience instead of a really plain, uh, plain speech. Yeah, right. So like a, 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 a monotonous sort of yeah. speech where there's no, they just keep talking, but it's in the same tone and they don't <coughs> write it out. Excellent. Right. 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 Um, something else I, I, I saw, um, maybe giving some jo jokes and mm -hmm. it was like relaxing and <coughs> at the beginning they maybe started with a joke or something mm -hmm. and, and also giving examples and bringing it like not only theoretical but like bringing it back to real life examples. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for me, they all look very secure, which I think it's very important to convince yeah. an audience. Because yeah. if you're shaking all the time, yeah. they're not going to pay attention to you. It's, that's really, really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, even I get very nervous before I speak. And I teach every day. And before I go and teach, I still get a little nervous. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not. I guess that might not be a very settling thought to start on. It's like, guess what? I've been doing this for a long time. And I'm very nervous all the time. <laughs> so you're like, oh. <laughs> but uh, it's something that there are some things that you can do to, to get over that. So. Um, other thoughts about the good? Anything that we haven't spoken about yet? Okay, what about some things you thought were maybe not as effective or not as good? Um, but do I specify the person that I'm speaking? You can if you want to. <laughs> okay, I, I We're all, one of the things about debate is that we'll, you know, we'll teach you about how to take criticism well and how to give criticism. Um, well. The second speaker of the opposition, mm -hmm. I don't know her name. Oh, uh, Maya. 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 She moved too much when she was speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. She and like from side to side, from side to side. And then she was like fiddling with her fingers. Uh -huh. And for me, it was very hard to pay attention because she was moving so much mm -hmm. that I didn't <coughs> see her. Because every time I saw her, I got distracted. Yeah. And when she wasn't speaking, when she was sitting down, every time I, either, party, either parties told her, like, well, because Maya's going to speak about, she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll speak about that. And then, it, it, like, for me, it showed a little bit of insecurity because it's uh -huh. like, it's not, it's not that, like, yeah, of course I'm going to speak. I'm, Okay, I, I might speak about that. Yeah. That was one thing. And then the um, the last speaker of the other party. Government. Mm. Government. He was too aggressive. He oh. was too aggressive. He was, he was throughout his was whole, his whole yes. um, minutes, he was talking too fast and sort of like yes. yelling. Like and he yelled all, all the, time. the time. He scared us the first yeah. the first <laughs> minute. It was I scary. Was, like, Seriously. He was aggressively monotonous. <laughs> Aggressively yeah. monotonous. I've never heard that phrase before. I'll have to write this one down. We should copyright that. That's very good. Um, yeah, yeah those, are, those are probably yeah. like my two like. Topics. No, those are that's very good. Those are very good observations. So we'll talk about that too a, a, a little bit later. Um, we'll talk about this thing about you know if you think that the debates are won and lost just based on what you're saying, like in your speech, it's not really the case because the judges are looking at everybody on the ground. Uh, anything that you're doing, like even when you're sitting there, can go against you. If you look like you're like, you know, to your <coughs> or something like that. Audiences read this stuff as uh, ways of um, uh, figuring out what you're about, what you're saying, and whether or not they should believe you. Uh, in public speaking books, uh, they say that your speech begins when you enter the room to give it. Everyone immediately starts judging you at that moment. So that's something to keep in mind is the way you conduct yourself, the way you comport yourself. 
very important, even if it's not your turn to speak. So it's very good. So other thoughts about things that were not as effective or were uh, troublesome to you or bothered you? <coughs> thought, well, like, why are they doing that? that is <coughs> um, I have insecurities about speaking about personal experiences mm -hmm. or personal mm -hmm. thoughts and sentiments. Um, I wanted to ask, but I didn't because I thought it would be better yeah. in class. Yeah. Um, if that's the only kind of evidence you present, and how should you present it if it's that personal? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Yeah, we can talk about that. That's a very specific question. We can talk about that at the end. But this is very good. It's regular approach. to make personal experience um, approaches. Yeah, I think um, I think there's definitely a place for it, but I think people disagree as to how much is okay and how much is not okay. We can discuss it. I mean, I think it's very good. But um, other things that you thought about the the speech, the speeches that were not so good. Did you want to add something? You had your or no? No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> yes. Yeah, I thought that there were some jokes that were made. It was funny. It would get your attention, but suddenly they. <coughs> Like went out from the attention of everyone because everyone was like suddenly distracted, like laughing, ah, ha, ha, and the guy was still talking. No, there were right. some ideas that were not explicitly like you know heard and they were, they were important. Yeah. So it's like when you're speaking in front of a crowd and you say something and everyone laughs. You should maybe pause for a second, mm -hmm. right, and let that finish yeah. so that they can hear your thing. You know, you won't be speaking in front of a crowd like that, you know, every day. But uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind is the audience reaction. How do you deal with that? So it's a very good, very good point. Yes? I think one something that I wouldn't do myself is the Johnny analogy mm -hmm. at the beginning of the speech, because then the whole speech didn't have an argument center, the yeah. Johnny center speech, yeah. everyone's <laughs> stupid you like that. You see Loke, Loke taking advantage of that. It's like, <laughs> on Johnny, on Johnny. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's like, it's sort, of, it's, sort of, it's sort of like in the United States uh, presidential debates, Joe the Plumber, right? So John, well, Johnny almost became our Joe the Plumber for, uh, for that debate. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's like, where do you, how do you start a speech? What's an effect of starting a speech? So it's good too. Any other thoughts about it? I think this is all good material, stuff I was planning on covering anyway, so it's pretty good. <coughs> Probably it handled in, in the first negative speak. He didn't have as much hand movement, although he had it while others were speaking, like, oh, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. But when he started to speak, he just yeah. put both his hands under, mm -hmm. probably under belly level. You should always speak under your chin, Oh, is that what you were talking? As a rule of Sorry. thumb. Yeah. But he was like, steam. Yeah, sometimes it's like, uh, there's, there's a really fine line with gesturing between something that looks yeah. very natural and then something that just it's looks overdone. repetitive, overdone. And then there are things that we might call are over-rehearsed, right? You, know, you hear about this critique in theater. Yeah. Say, well, that was pretty good, but the actor was overacting. What does that mean? Not he's not natural. Yeah, it's not natural. It's too far. You're, the illusion is spoiled. You can see that it's sort of pretty nice. So we always uh, uh, talk about, uh, I made up a disease for this. It's called bad high school actor syndrome, which is where you feel like you should stay completely <laughs> you know, stiff like this and then talk, and then you go over here, and you sort of be like this. And it just looks so completely unnatural, it kind of freaks out. And these things can distract from your very good arguments. Right? You'll have a lot of training at the academy about how to do arguments, how to make arguments, how to connect from personal experience, things like that. But my point in this sem seminar this morning is to tell you, none of that stuff matters unless you can effectively get it across to the audience. So that's what we're going to work on today. It's some of these things, these exact things that you've brought up. And so I think about public speaking in terms of organization and style are the two categories that I break it down in, into. And I think organization, although it's a part of argumentative studies, it's really important to talk about how to do that in, in speech. And style is the other component, which is how you conduct yourself. So let's start a little bit with style, because that seems to be the better place to start. And but before you can have a good style, you need to overcome what we call performance anxiety, or stage fright, or there's a lot of names for it. But it's that anxiety, that that, er, that feeling you get before you get up there that, oh my gosh, you know, it's my turn to speak, right? Did anybody experience <coughs> this feeling? Everybody does. Yeah. I think everybody does. There's some people like, oh. But I think in certain situations, something that's very important to you, you'll feel it. It sort of feels like a knot, or the, the, as, as we say, butterflies in your stomach. Um, this sort of feeling. Now this feeling, I can't get rid of it for you. I think it's something that comes from our, our primal days, when we were sort of primitive people, or when we were uh, paleolithic, to where <laughs> if you're in your group of fellow humans, 
and everyone's staring at you, it means that you're probably about to get eaten. That there's something <laughs> coming up behind you because everyone's like, <laughs> so that experience, anthropologically through time, has made us feel like when the group is staring at you, something bad is about to happen. So your body releases adrenaline, and adrenaline is a chemical that increases your heart rate, increases the blood flow, it, it encourages the liver to release sugar into the blood to give you extra energy so you can run like hell, right? So it's like a flight response, kind of thing, something bad is about to happen. So if you try to ignore it and just push through it, strange things are going to happen because your body must burn the energy on. Things will start to happen as you speak that might not be the best sorts of things because you have to get rid of this energy, right? And so all kinds of strange stuff you start to do. And you might not even be aware of it. You'll be doing all this stuff and you'll be like, oh, you moved too much. Or I didn't move at all. Because <laughs> you're thinking about your arguments. You're not thinking about where your body is. So here's a trick. It's kind of a simple trick, but it might help you overcome if you feel this feeling is sort of overwhelming. Is that you can, before you speak, on your way up to the podium, you can sort of squeeze your fist very hard next to you. You can even put your hand in your pocket. And squeeze very hard to kind of try to burn off some of this extra energy. Right, trying to, to deal with that, you can do it to where people, I mean, you don't want the people to think you're going to come up and punch them. Like you said, that argument was so bad, I have no other reason to punch you. But if you do something like this, it can help you burn some of the extra energy off, and at least it'll make you feel a little bit better. Because then it's sort of used a little bit. The other way you can do it is to sort of plan how you're going to move, and plan how you're going to gesture, and use the same thing in your head all the time when you're speaking. That way you won't do any sort of random movement. You'll be like, okay, when I move to my second point, I know by then I'm going to need to move somewhere, so maybe I can take a couple of steps over here, and then that'll make you feel a little bit better. And then you can speak from there, and it also helps you keep organized, keep your thoughts in your head in the right order, because you're like, if I'm standing here, I know I must be on the second point. <coughs> right? And then after that, you can kind of move, maybe move over here and talk about another point. So if you sort of plan it out, we call this sort of maybe a triangle as a basic beginner sort of way of doing it, is you can maybe start from one point, and then as you move through the points, every time you change points, you can change your position. That way you won't, you know, pace, which can be quite distracting, right? That way you won't rock back and forth, which is very popular. And if you have a podium, sometimes you rock the podium and move it around. It can make noises that you might not be conscious of, but the audience finds very distracting. They could echo, it could uh, knock in such a weird way. I've seen this happen many times if there's a podium of some kind. So style, I've kind of gotten ahead of myself a little bit, but I think <coughs> style can be broken down into four subcategories. Your eye contact your volume, your rate, and your stance. Your eye contact, your volume, your rate, and your stance. What I was just talking about was stance, which is sort of like for ancient Greeks or ancient Romans, they would talk about it in terms of delivery. That was the whole category of delivery, which is how you use your body and your voice, the production of your voice, to get your point across very uh, in, in an effective way. So planning the movement out. Planning how you'll gesture, maybe have a, a few that you like to use. Don't use the same one all the time, but at natural points, when you really feel like you want to, you know, I feel like I want to give you something, right? I'm trying to give you the information, I might do something like this. You don't want to do the same gesture all the time. You don't want to feel like compelled to gesture. You want to sort of do it in sort of a natural way that emphasizes what you're talking about. Right? It might, you might see people who get trapped in the, oh, I feel like I need to gesture. So they're always sort of doing this as they talk. And people are like, wow, how many times are they going to do that before you know, the speech is over. And then you have people in the audience who maybe aren't so nice or maybe not paying attention and they start to keep a count. You know, and they share with their friends, you know, stuff like that. You don't want to do, you don't want to do anything that <coughs> give the audience encouragement to not listen to your arguments. Everything that you do is supposed to support that. Right? So that's stance, how you move, how you control yourself, how you gesture. Eye contact. Eye contact in debate is extremely important. We talked about making an audience feel comfortable or making the audience, I think somebody, somebody said, they're very friendly to the audience, is what she said. I think that's a very good point. Because everything we do, we do with the audience in mind. Right? How are we effective towards this audience? How do we make this audience feel good? And the way it's talked about by people who study public speaking is you want to speak conversationally. Because right? audiences respond poorly if you're pedantic, if you speak to them as if they're little school children who need correction, like you're pedantic. Or if you speak to them in a tone of, uh, I know a lot more about this but if you speak to, the, to them in a tone of sharing, that we're equals, it seems very friendly. It's a very friendly sort of style. Uh, this would be that you don't want to uh, speak in a way that makes it sound like everything that they've just heard is just idiotic. You don't want to be, uh, what is it, monotonously aggressive? Is that what she said? <laughs> you don't want to speak in such a way that if you feel like you're attacking the audience. You're going to feel like the audience and you are co-constructing 
the argument. You're working together on the argument. So that can be a speech where you ask a lot of questions, maybe simulate the conversation. I mean, this might go more into argumentation, but you can say things like, instead of, you know, this argument was really bad, and da 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 and you sort of berate the audience, attack them with all the things you want to say. You can say, I don't think this argument is very good. I mean, I think if I were sitting out there, I would be asking these questions. Da, da, da. And I think the answers are pretty obvious. Da, 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 da. This kind of thing, the audience is more likely to be on your side. <coughs> they feel like they've co-constructed the argument with you. So eye contact is an important part of this. Eye contact is, instead of looking at your notes all the time, it seems like a good way to get over performance anxiety. It's like, all these people are staring at me. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> now I have my notes. I'll be just fine. Right? Uh, you also don't want to go overboard on eye contact, which is like something very creepy. <laughs> You're like, okay, good. Back the other way. <laughs> you want to maybe, if you have a large audience, it's different than when you have a small audience. So I'll talk about the large audience first. Because that's something that's um, more rare for you at this point. And as you get better and better, you have larger audiences. And I think it's important to include them <coughs> in your speech style when you're speaking in front of a large audience. Because it makes it, uh, even if there's only you know, maybe five adjudicators, if there's a big audience watching the debate, it's good to include all of them because the adjudicators pay attention to things like this. They're like, wow, that was great style. Very nice. You want to divide the audience maybe into three different sections. And then pick two or three very friendly looking people from that section and make eye contact with them. And most of the audience, if it's a big audience, will feel that you're attending to them with eye contact. <coughs> it's very simple. And you can pick two or three people who don't intimidate you or that you're not attracted to who might screw you up, right? You don't want to pick the person to make eye contact with who you're attracted to or you know, who you think is like the most horrible looking, uh, melted person that you've ever seen in your life. Because these things will like throw you off, right? You'll be looking and you'll be like, you know, oh, what's wrong with their nose? You want to pick people who are sort of friendly looking and don't shock you, right? And people who you, don't pick your friends, they in the audience, because then you can get into this horrible sort of uh, self-collapsing giggle thing, where you're just speaking and then you see your friend and you're like, mm. so da -da. stop, don't look, she's looking at me. Uh, this kind of thing can throw you off. So maybe don't look at somebody you're very close to, but look at somebody you sort of maybe you're neutral towards. And you can think of them as a barometer for how well you're doing in the debate, because they provide the speaker with something very important, which is feedback, right? We always get feedback from audiences. Like right now, I'm getting feedback from all of you. Some of you are writing things down. I read that as a good thing. Some of you are nodding. That's good, right? In some of my classes when I teach back in the US, the only kind of feedback I get, because they don't, you know, you guys want to be here, and you've come a long way to be here, and you really want to learn. But sometimes, I get students who are just kind of put into my class, because they have to take it. And the only kind of feedback I get is this. <laughs> You know, it's not very exciting. So how do you deal with that? You know, that can really pull the wind out of your sails if you look in the audience and you see people just kind of like, you know. That's important information. It can throw you off at first, but it's important. That's why it's important to always be making eye contact because you just say, this isn't really working. I need to shift gears here. I need to change things to really get the audience back onto my side. But most of the time, your audience will be nodding, and that's good, and it can help you feel. Now, there are some people in the audience who sit there and they nod at everything, right? You know, so that's why you don't want to just look at the same people. And it's going to be very hard at first when you're speaking and people are nodding. You're always going to want to look at those people because it makes you feel good. You're like, oh, I'm making sense. But then by the end of it, you're just looking at one person because they're always like nodding. You're like, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. And you're speaking just to them. So it's an easy thing to fall into. So always make sure you keep that three, that section, the three sections thing going. Now for a smaller group, right? Let's say you're just debating in front of maybe three judges, maybe the other team. It's a good idea to look not just at the chair, but look at all the other different judges making eye contact and trying to look them directly into the eyes and try to get your point across to show. Instead of constantly looking at your notes or maybe looking over at the other team. Uh, you know, let's say if I was debating against him, if I'm making arguments against them, should I be making eye contact with them and say, oh, so you said in your last speech you said this and that's totally wrong. We disagree with you. Da -da. And the judges are sitting out here. I see this all the time. Why would I be trying to change his mind? He's not going to change his mind. His job is to debate against me. Right? The minds I'm trying to change are the adjudicator's minds. Right? Those are the people who actually make the decision. That's the mind I have to change. So even when I'm speaking about the things that the other team has brought up, I don't need to look at them to do that. Because those are those three, let's say if these are the three judges, they're the decision makers. They're the ones who can actually change something. They, I, I can't change his mind because, well, you know, he wants to win too. So he's not going to be like, oh, you know, you're right. I'm glad that we had this personal exchange. <laughs> my mind is saying, I totally changed my point of view. You're great. Thank you. I mean, it might happen. I don't know where that would happen. But it could, um, maybe in some fantasy, I 
friends, but these are the people who you want to be convincing. So that's why the eye contact is very important to show that you're very attentive. Like, I know you have the power to make a decision here. Here's why I'm arguing this better. You're really pushing it across the okay. So the last two, volume. You want to speak at an appropriate volume, which isn't the volume that you'd speak to with your friends, like if you're having a conversation, unless you're really like shouting them down. Right? And you also don't want to speak <coughs> in terms that are too quiet. You have to think, the best way I can tell you to have a good volume is think about what's a comfortable level that you think you could be heard at, and then just tweak it a little bit, <coughs> just a little bit louder than you think is necessary. And that way the people at the back are able to hear you very well. Right? Volume is very important because the other the thing is, a lot of times people are sort of very nervous and they think if they talk quieter, it'll make them feel better. But generally, people can't really hear it if you're just speaking in your normal tone of voice. So you need to speak a little bit louder. It doesn't mean you have to yell or anything like that. You need to project your voice. So you want to speak from your diaphragm, projecting and sort of throwing it out. Whereas if I'm in an interpersonal conversation, I can speak very quietly, you know, this kind of thing. But if I want everyone to hear me, and I'm also doing eye contact, over here, you know, Debbie's sitting over here, she might not be able to hear me very clearly unless I speak very loud. Right? So you want to speak a little bit louder than you're used to or than you feel comfortable with in an interpersonal situation. And the second thing is, volume can be uh, a problem at the end of your thought. The end of your thought is just as important as the beginning. A lot of times people will be speaking, and they say, so opposition made this argument about blah, 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 and we on the government feel that this argument is really bad because it's a human. Okay, so on our next point, da -da. so it's like as you reach the end of your point, it doesn't mean you get quieter. Actually, you need to be just as loud there as you were at the beginning of the point. Both of them are just as, it's like a capsule, right? So you have this part, you have the medicine, your argument in the middle, and your volume is this part of the capsule and this, you put it together, and then the audience can swallow it together. So you have to be just as loud at the end as you were at the beginning. Just don't trail off at the end of your statements. That's something that's very, if you get into that habit, it's very hard to break. So you always want to end very strongly on your point. Right? Also with volume, you can use volume for effect, which is a more advanced sort of tool for volume. You can use it to really get everybody's attention to be very loud, and then you can shift to something a little bit <coughs> to really get people's attention, to make sure they're paying attention. So you can speak in terms like this, and then as things get more intense, you can increase the volume to symbolize how important things are getting. Right? So you can use it as a sliding scale, as long as your base volume is something that isn't hard to hear. You want people to be able to hear it. But you can certainly change the uh, volume for effect. So don't leave these tools out. It's good to have, it's very important to have good arguments. But you can have the best sorts of arguments in the world if you don't have an effective way to get them across. It doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter. People won't listen to you. So always you know, keep in mind these, these things aren't really going to win a debate for you by themselves. But you want to keep them in mind as ways of accenting your arguments, framing your arguments, getting your arguments across to the audience of effective ways. So that's volume. And then the last one is rate. Rate is how quickly you speak. Now, it seems to me more and more, the more debates that I see, a lot of people feel like they really need to go very fast because they have a lot of information they want to cover and a lot of arguments that they need to attend to. So you see people speaking very rapidly to make sure that they cover everything. This might not be the best way of going about it. Because what happens if you go too fast? People don't hear. So it's like you you, you didn't say it anyway. What did you say? Or you won't, or they won't, won't follow. follow. Yeah, they won't follow. They don't understand. understand. Yeah, they won't understand. So with rate, it doesn't mean that you're trying to find the best rate to cover everything, to put everything you want to say in there as quickly as you can, which seems to be the way a lot of people are thinking these days. It's actually much more important to um, use pauses to allow the audience to digest. That's part of rate as well. Using pauses to let the audience digest what you just said is an important part of rate. You want to go at an effective rate. If you have an audience that can handle <coughs> a lot of information quickly, then maybe that's the effective thing to do. But for most audiences, they like to sort of think about things. Maybe I'm naive, but most audiences really want to think about things before they make a decision. They want to examine all the different aspects of it. So you want to give them time to think about that and digest what you said. So sometimes an effective pause is really a great way of using rate. It doesn't mean like I'm going to try to be understandable and go quickly. I have so much to say, and they said this, and my reputation is this, these three things. You don't really want to do that. You might want to sit, pause with the audience and say, let's really think about what this argument is saying. Here's what they're saying. They're saying X, Y, Z. Well, is that something we want to endorse? I don't think so. Right? So something like that, using the pauses, can be just as effective as going quickly. Okay. So that's sort of what I want to talk about basic style.
how to control the floor, how to control your voice, how to go the right speed, and how to use eye contact. So those things are very important things. Now let's talk for a few minutes about organization and organization's role in a good speech. Every good speech has a very basic organization. An introduction, a main body, and a conclusion. This is something you already know, I'm sure, since you've probably written a paper or you've probably given a presentation so to somebody some, at some point in time. Introduction. All good speeches have some way of getting the audience into your speech. It's an invitation. Think of it as an invitation to listen to what you have to say. Right? A good introduction to the speech is not something like, wow, there's so many good arguments, I'm just going to jump right in. I said, well, yeah, I know that there's good arguments. I've been watching the debate, and I know you're going to respond to them. So this doesn't really help get me excited about listening to you. This is kind of what I expected would happen anyway. A good introduction also isn't to reread re the motion and say, yes, this is what we're debating today. Very good. And I'm going to offer some refutation and then some of my own arguments. And then I'm going to tell you a conclusion about the refutation and the arguments. Now, is that really... I mean, it's not all that great. As an invitation, it's not that great, but you, I hear this all the time. And I just wonder, you just spent like 45 seconds or a minute of the only seven minutes I'm going to hear you in the debate. Why did you use it for that? It's good to let me know what's going to happen, but can't you do it in a way that's much more palatable? Can't you do it in a way that's a lot more inviting? If you got a party invitation, I said, come to a party where there will be a party, a celebration, festivities, and then at the end, there will be cleanup. <laughs> No, it'd be like, come join us for a rockin' night. It's going to be awesome. Everything you've ever wanted to do is going to be here. And you know you shouldn't do. Something like that is a much better invitation. So in thinking about that with an introduction, there are several ways you can introduce a speech that are very basic but good. You can offer a famous quotation. You can offer a question to the audience. Now, there's two kinds of questions you can offer. You can offer a rhetorical question which is a question that you don't want anyone to answer, you just want them to think about. Or you can offer an actual question that you do want people to respond to. How do you distinguish that? You can distinguish it through your volume, through your style, through your body movements, can indicate whether or not you want one of these questions to, to uh, be answered or not. So if I approach you and I say, how many of you have uh, owned a car? And I do like this. What does this indicate? You want us to answer. Yeah, I want you to answer. Something very simple like that can be the the um, distinguishing factor. If I want it to be more of a rhetorical question, I can say, uh, how many of you have ever considered or you own a car now? I want you to think about your car. And I want you to think about your responsibilities in owning that car. Right? That kind of an introduction gets people to start to start thinking. Now there's two things that happen with an introduction like that. First of all, I get you all to think about something central to my speech. And secondly, I've just helped you to forget what the person who's sitting in front of you who might be really, really good, <laughs> I might get you to push their arguments to the side for a bit. Instead of immediately accepting their frame and their arguments they've offered, what I've offered you is a cleansing of the palate. Right? So I say the introduction is the most important part of the organization because it's like a wine tasting. You ever go to a wine tasting? Anybody has? You have? What, what happens between tastings? What do they do? You should take something like coffee or anything to clean your palate so yeah. that you can go again. Yeah. Sometimes they offer you a cracker, a bit of bread. Um, coffee, something like that, to cleanse the palate. We need to do the exact same thing in debate with our speech style. You want to cleanse the palate from the person who just spoke <coughs> and get all of the attention on what you're going to say. So if you get up and say, I'm going to respond to what they just talked about, and then I'm going to give you my new arguments, not really a cleansing the palate. It's just like drinking the next wine immediately on top of the other one. What's going to happen is the audience, the judges, are not going to get the flavor of your arguments. It's always going to be tainted by the flavor of who came before. So you want to offer some kind of cleansing, some introduction, a quote, question, you can make a factual statement, something that really uh, blows people's mind, a fact that would uh, reframe the whole thing, a fact that hasn't been brought up yet. You can also offer a startling statement. It can be a fact, but it can also be something else. And you can also use something humorous, which I think is something that we see quite a bit. But with humor, you have to be careful. You have to be very careful when you use a humorous introduction that the joke will not offend anyone in the audience, that the humor is something that they will actually get. Because right? if they don't get it, then it's, there's nothing worse than that. If you offer something you think is really funny, and they're like, oh, ah, ah, and everyone's like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so moving on. <laughs> really hard to recover. So I say, at first, work on the structure without trying to be funny. Because if you're focusing on trying to be funny, everything else is going to go away. Right? <coughs> focus on that, 
and you'll lose the thing that's really important, which is the structure staying organized with the points you want to talk about. So in your introduction, after you get attention, <coughs> the introductory, the attention guy, which is what I was talking about, you need to maybe give a quick statement about what you are going to talk about in the speech, what you are going to talk about. And this is your thesis statement, the main idea of your speech. So if you're speaking as the opening government or opening opposition, this is where you would give the line of your team as to what it is that you stand for. If you're closing government, closing opposition, this is where you would also give, here's what we stand for, this is what we are going to convey to you. This is a bad idea because, this is a good idea because, is a very basic way to frame it. And that seems like a very simple thing, but it's very important because it's sort of the, the container for everything that you're going to give them in your speech. All of your examples, all your personal statements, all your arguments, all your refutation, those are the things that are going to be placed into that container, and you give them something to carry it around with, is this main idea. Imagine if you went grocery shopping and they didn't have any bags. They should be like, here you go, here's all your stuff. And you're like, oh, I can't really, you know, it's starting to stack up. You start to drop things, right? Things start to get left out because the new things are coming at you, and you're like, oh, I have to deal with this. Things might be falling out, and you have no idea, because you don't have a container. This is what you do to your judge if you don't set up any kind of a thesis or a main idea. They're trying to collect all this stuff, and they're trying to figure out how to hold it, and you've given them no container with which to do that. If you give them the main idea, your line, the box that you're it's like, this is what you're about, then they can put those things in the bag and say, I can see where this fits. So it's very important. It seems like a very simple thing. Sometimes it even seems obvious. People tell me, why do you need to do that? It's very obvious that I'm opposition. Well, I know that. I know your opposition. But tell me how you're opposing. Tell me what you are opposing on. What are you standing on to oppose? That's the container. It's very important. Then, after you've done all that, then comes your preview, which is the thing that most people start with, which is I'm going to refute, and then I'm going to give my new arguments. This is the last part of the beginning of the organization of your speech, which is here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to refute their arguments. Then you can give a little preview and tell you why their entire plan is based on contradiction, or their entire arguments are based on contradiction. You want to kind of get, it's like a movie preview, a trailer. Like, this is the part of the speech where you kind of give a little foresight to that. Then you would say, and then the second thing I'm going to do is tell you why my partner and I believe, blah, 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 blah. and you kind of flag your extension, that new argument, what it is that you're going to talk about, or maybe that, that, that uh, thesis statement or that main idea. If you're a second speaker on the opening tables, this can be the place where you would say, you would just reaffirm that, that line. You say, so I'm going to refute their arguments and tell you why all their arguments are based on contradiction. Then I'm going to say, talk about the important forgotten part of what the Prime Minister just talked about. This important element that they didn't touch on at all. And then finally, I'll get to my new argument, which will be blah, blah, blah. Now you've given a little frame of not only have you given them a bag, but you told them in what order the things are going to come. So now they can efficiently stack all the things you say into that container. And then when it comes time to do the adjudication, everything is perfectly done on their own. And they can say, oh, they did this, 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 here's where it is. Now, how do you stay organized? If you offer that nice thing at the beginning, how do you make sure you stay organized as you're speaking? Because you have a lot of things going on. First of all, you have your notes. You're trying to re respond and make the arguments. The timer is going. People are trying to ask points. A lot of things are going on at the same time. How do you stay organized to make sure you follow through <coughs> on that order? Do you have any ideas on that? This is like the hardest question I think we're going to have today. People are trying to get points, you're like waving them down, you're looking at your timer, you're looking at the audience, you're trying to be good with your eye contact, all these things going on. How do you make sure not to leave anything out? <coughs> Maybe you have it written down, like certain points you want to talk about and the organization you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could have it on your, on your paper. This is where notes become extremely important. The way you take notes becomes extremely important. Because you can mark it, you can flag the things on your notes that are going to be the different points. You can even put like one two, three, whatever the points are, and put the number next to them so that you know exactly what it is that you're going to um, talk about. You can also use another piece of paper and try to rewrite the things very quickly before your speech into those different categories. Other suggestions? And this is a really difficult, probably the most difficult you know, issue. I guess what works for me is that I try to rely on nothing will happen. I will just get caught in trying to do everything at the mm. time. So I realize to say, I'll just make sure I say this right now. And then later I'll attend the question. And yep. then I'll see the clock and see if I'm on time. And like that. That's good. Trying to stay in a calm frame of mind is very important. And plan ahead your time. Just you know your arguments, you know how long you need to express them, you know how fast you speak, you know your rate. Mm. You have an idea of the time it will take you. So rather than just 
writing down every argument, you write down 45 seconds, you write down 90 seconds, you write down, so you can look at the clock and say, well, I have time enough to answer one question. Mm -hmm. And this is an argument when I can't answer a question. Mm -hmm. For there are times or arguments that you know have weak spot, and you realize that they will find it eventually. Because mm -hmm. you didn't have time to make perfect arguments, it right. always happens. Yeah, so you right. don't want to entertain a question there. Mm -hmm. And if that is, you never should make that a central argument. Then, then again, goes with the Johnny point. If you make that a central argument, even if this is your first, they're gonna call you on that even at last uh, the end of your speech. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's one of these things where you have to make sure. Like I think <coughs> the, the thing you're suggesting is maybe you could put how much time you should spend on each point. Exactly. Next year, you know, like maybe two minutes, two or three minutes here, three or four minutes here. You can even do that. Like your notes are for you. There's no real <coughs> standard way of taking notes in any debate style. Uh, it has to be something that works for you. So even if you think it looks really weird and embarrassing, you don't have to show anyone your notes. Right? They're just for you. So keep them just for yourself to help you stay organized and focused. So with all this stuff that's going on, one of the best ways, I think, to stay organized is to, you have all the notes from the debate. If you're speaking later, of course, if you're speaking earlier, this isn't really a problem because you have you know, a lot less to, to handle. But if you're speaking later, you have all of your notes on one page from the debate, it might be a good idea to get a brand new page just for your speech and to leave large spaces in it of the main points that you're going to talk about. You can put like, that's what I kind of do. I put my introduction <coughs> sort of at the top, whatever it is I think I might want to start with to sort of get things going. And then I have written down it, maybe two or three points with big spaces. And then as things go on, I can sort of look at my notes on a separate piece of paper and I can jot some things in there in order to make sure that they get covered. And then I can put the times next to it. And I can do this very quickly <coughs> because I've been doing this for you know a little while. But at first, you want to just try and experiment different ways of doing this. This is what I would suggest to you is leave some spaces to make sure that you can add in things for your notes so that you only bring up that one piece of paper that has those things. And that way, you don't get sort of disorganized by looking through you know five or six different pieces of paper that have different people's arguments on it. This is sort of your master sheet that will help you stay organized during that. Right? So, in speech, when you're getting into the material, there are two very important things that you always have to do when you are expressing your material. First, you have to flag what it is that you're talking about. You need to identify extremely clearly what the argument is, what point you're dealing with in the speech, and where it is in the debate so that the judges can find it very quickly. So like on the first thing, they make an argument. Like you hear a lot of people say, well, they make an argument about violence. Here's what I have to say about that. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That might not be good enough. If violence is a very large part of the debate, you might want to <coughs> specify a lot more than just the violence argument. Right? You might want to say, the last speaker tells you on the violence argument, da, 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 da. Now, this is the best, uh, this is the most succinct uh, articulation of that that we've heard so far. Let me give you the reasons why we think this is a bad argument. And then you can look at your notes and go through the things that you wanted to say. You can only spend a couple minutes on it. So make sure that you are flagging it very clearly so that everyone knows exactly what it is that you're talking about. The second thing that's very important that doesn't get done a lot is you need to transition from subpoint to subpoint. You need to transition. You need to make sure that as you move from one point to another one, that you very clearly indicate that you've done this. Because that's where a lot of great arguments get lost. My judges aren't perfect, they're trying to think of a lot of things at once. And they're also uh, really engaged in the debate because they're trying to give you the most fair hearing that they can. So they're really mulling over every word that comes out of your mouth. They're really twisting it, thinking it over. So they might not be paying attention close enough to, to know when you move to another point. And they might miss some of your best arguments on that point because they think they applied it so. And they're like, oh, these things are irrelevant. Oh, maybe they go on this next point. Oh, I don't know if they do. Well, did they say that they're moving to the next point? And all this is the internal dialogue of the judge. While they're doing that, they're not listening as carefully to you as you would like them to, which is very dangerous. So a transition <coughs> is just a little group of words that indicates that you're moving on. Right? So the way I teach transition, I think, in a very basic form, now as you get more advanced, you can, you can uh, <coughs> really make sure to push the transition to make it very, the best kind of transitions are very relevant to the argument. But the more basic kind of transitions are things that are like, now that we've seen how, blah, 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 uh, how we dealt with this. The next thing we need to look at is, it's a very basic transition, right? You can make it more complicated, more advanced, if you use it more directly in the arguments that are in the debate, right? So if you can somehow connect up 
those uh, those arguments to each other as part of the transition, and that can be really really effective. So one of the things you might want to do is be a, sort of a collector of different transitions because you don't want to use the same one over and over again. Like in American forms of debate, there are two transitions that get overused. In American policy debate, I don't know if you've ever seen that or heard of it. Or there's other kinds of American <coughs> types of debate, but the transitions that get overused are additionally and next. Right? And so they'll say, additionally, 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 and that means I'm moving between arguments under the same point. And like, additionally and next, that means new point. Right? Now this is extremely, the technical answer is really sort of bad. <laughs> In a way, there's really no other way to, to discuss it because it doesn't help frame or close off that point. So if you're doing your refutation, let's say you have two major areas of refutation. Refutation of the model and refutation of some of maybe the examples that they use that prove the model will work, right? So after you're done refuting the model, you can say, now that we've seen why the model fails, we need to look at why some of most of their examples that tell you about the problem also fail because they're just not based in reality. Let's go to the first example. Then these transitions are very important for keeping the flow of the debate together. <clears throat> so always make sure that you do that. Now, how much matter should you have? <coughs> a question that comes up a lot in public speaking. For us, it's not really in debate. It's not really something we can control. You have to address certain things. You can't leave certain things out. It's very important that you uh, cover everything that needs to be covered in, in the debate. So you have to decide how much stuff you want to cover, when to leave something out or not. What you, what you, uh, you don't get to choose that. What you do get to choose is how to set that up. Is it a good idea to follow the organization of the person who just spoke right in front of you? Like if they had three new points and then two points of reputation, should you refute all three new ones and then do the two and then refute their then deal with their reputation exactly the way that they did it? Or what do you think about that? I mean, you have to cover all of it. Right? You can't leave anything out. I think it's helpful to follow the uh, the, way, the way that they did it the one before because it gives the judge like he can follow. Okay, this is he refuted this argument. He refuted this argument, and it's easy to to follow, it's mm -hmm. easy to understand, mm -hmm. to that see that you're actually refuting all arguments. Yeah. But on the other hand, you're restraining your speech to whatever the other speaker said, so you're actually giving them credit for that, and you should never give them anything because you're competing the, uh, the minds of the audience and the judge towards your point. So you shouldn't be so strict as the order of the other speaker. Okay, but what about what she's saying? Like, what if the speaker who went in front of you was very clear and gave a very nice packaging? That also depends on what you're going to say. Yeah. Because perhaps you have stronger, a stronger, we were like, for like, if she had like three arguments mm -hmm. and you know that you're going to provide better evidence against one of her, one of her arguments, then perhaps you should place that in another point. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it also depends on what you're going to say. Because perhaps you have very weak arguments for the first two. So it's like a weak argument, then a weak argument, and then a really a strong one. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you should organize it. So you think the stronger one should come before the weak argument? I'm not saying and how we should uh -huh. organize it. Perhaps we should have like a strong, a weak, and a strong one, mm -hmm. but not like organize weak and strong because you might lose the attention of non-believers. Mm -hmm. And right. if the other party is extremely clear, then you don't need to be organized in the same manner because the judge is going to find clearly uh -huh. the way through your arguments because your argument is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts about that? I just think that if the arguments of the other party were really good, you should try to uh, give them the contra arguments, you know, refute those arguments first, and then make your own arguments. But in the other hand, if the arguments of the other team was, were not so good, then you should give your arguments first and then refute whatever they said. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if their arguments aren't so good, then you do yours first and then mm -hmm. you can deal with theirs. Because if you can deal with it quickly, then maybe it should be near the, closer to the end. So what part of the speech do you think it's easier for the judge to pay attention to? Like when you're getting into the argument, after you've done the introduction, you've done all that stuff, is it better to put the more important things at the very beginning or the more important things at the end? Like which part of the speech is the part that the judges are going to remember the most? I think in all cases for people, they start paying attention and they start losing attention on the way. Okay. But then at, at the end, you should have a really strong finish, which is because that's what people are going to remember. They're going to remember how you finish. Right. So if you have a really weak finish, then perhaps it will ruin all the strong evidence that you provided at the first minutes, because since there were seven. So you have to like have strong arguments at the beginning, but also strong arguments at the end. Maybe, what did you say? Maybe in the middle, not mm -hmm. like 
In the middle might be hard to, yeah. like in the debate last night, were there times during the speeches where you caught yourself sort of drifting off somewhere, thinking about something else? I think it's impossible to maintain like the attention. I mean, the speeches would be really, really awesome mm -hmm. for you to be equally in, like uh, paying attention throughout the whole speech. But I think that what's a law is that everybody sort of starts paying attention because when, when a new speaker comes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a very few moments when a new speaker comes up to capture the novelty of being up there. That's why the introduction is so important to cleanse the palate and get things framed in the way you'd like them. <coughs> now you have arguments of different importance that you don't know, which, which are arguments <coughs> oh, bless you, bless you. <coughs> and you sort of know which arguments are your, your weaker arguments and which ones are your stronger arguments. This is a really horrible question to ask you because there really is no right answer to that. But it's something to think about. Should stronger arguments come before weaker arguments? Should they be mixed? Should the weaker come first and then the stronger at the end? Uh, there's some really good ideas that you guys are talking about. Right? If the other person is very well organized, there's no reason that you should have to follow them because it'll be easy for the, for the judge to find the arguments on the floor. But then again, if you decide to follow that exactly, maybe you're giving them something right, that you might not want to give up to them, right? which is this idea that you're covering the arguments in their order of importance. So you want to think about that. Don't just automatically follow it when you're organizing a speech because they are organized it in a way that's advantageous to them. So you might want to organize it in a way that's more advantageous to you. Also, what, what I just thought is that if they have like, I don't know, like five, five arguments and perhaps you're not going to tackle one of them, if you remain very strict with the order, it's going to be a lot more obvious that you're skipping one of the arguments. All right. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there you should like change the order of it. The other thing as well, along with this, if you're going to go out of order or something like that, is that you can do something called grouping arguments, which is where you sort of flag and you say, I'm dealing with these two separate points they made under one point myself. Right? And so that can help make it more organized. And it can also give you this added advantage of sort of characterizing what their arguments are about in such a way that the uniqueness of each one is sort of lost to the overall identification of the group. And if it's a good identification, then maybe the next speaker will pick it up. And you can say, oh, good, now I don't have to deal with this terrible, <laughs> you know, this really hard argument anymore because now they're both grouped together. Plus, there is a possible disadvantage if you're extremely organized. If the judge didn't catch every argument of your counterpart and you're extremely organized tackling them, the judge might catch it. So mm -hmm. it may go right. back to the flow and write down an argument he missed from your counterpart. So you actually gave, in a way, some time of your speech to your counterpart yeah. to make it clear. Yeah, that's a very tiny, but it's kind of an interesting, <coughs> kind of an interesting point. Is Let's say that... Um, you're, you have taken extremely careful notes, and maybe the judge hasn't. And you're like, on their third response, da 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 they're like, third response? Oh, I only had two. Like, okay, cool. Two, 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 two. Right? That's what you're talking about, right? And this is kind of a small small point, but it is kind of funny, uh, funny point as well, is that sometimes if you're very well organized, you don't want to put the organization above like the point of the argument or the point of the debate. You can respond, and you don't have to respond in such specific surgical terms. To everything's being said. This is where grouping comes in. This is where dealing with the principle comes in. All these things can be good for the organization of your points as well. But I wouldn't necessarily worry so much about that because who knows? I mean, I would assume every judge I have is probably taking pretty good notes. There might be some that, that aren't, but I'd rather not know that. I'd rather just assume that they are, and I want to do a very good job as far as I don't want to leave anything out because then later I'll kick myself when I like you know run out of time or forget to bring up this very important point. I'm like, oh man, I wish I'd done that. Uh, would have been much better. So I don't want to have any of those things at the end after I do. I don't want to have any of that kind of stuff. So I try to stay very well um, but organized. Steve, uh, this is the point. Yeah. But technically, if you want to organize yourself, what, what I normally do when I teach my students is that if you hear the biggest argument, the strongest one, the most damaging one, you must stack it on the person. Will you suck it first? No, no, you must. Let's say you hear the biggest argument and the last resounding sound of the person is about this idea. <coughs> Your first words must relate to that and say you must kill this argument, damage control, and then you move on. Because you want to, like I said, you want to turn the page, right? So you want to turn the page on your side, and the first thing to do is to take down the biggest, uh, big picture argument they have, not a small point. So once you do that, then the, the audience, oh yeah, now we're going to something else. That's why I'm on yeah. yeah, that's really good. That's a really good observation as well. Because what you think might be very important is not very important. Sometimes. Here's the thing that happens to me a lot. I'll hear an argument that they'll make.
that I think is incredibly silly, very bad, that I can easily answer the argument. So I'm like, ah, oh, great, awesome. So I spend a lot of time working on that. Now, this argument might be some side issue. So just because you can respond to an argument really, really, really well, and you can beat it, it doesn't mean that you should. That's not an important argument necessarily. You need to take a step back, like Locke is saying, and find the most important, most resounding argument, the one that is the most critical to do damage control. So if the speaker in front of you had a really awesome, very, very first refutation of the case, let's say your government, big refutation of the case is the case is completely contradictory. And they make a really good argument on this. You know, people are knocking, people are like, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, wow. Then later on, they make some factual error, error about some area of history that you happen to know something about because you're very weird and geeky and you read every little book on it. You're like, oh, I'm going to totally destroy them on that. They got the year wrong. Da, 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 da. Right? Maybe it's the natural thing to do is to call them out on being wrong on a fact or something like that. But the thing you have to do is think in the big picture of the debate, where is the most important place to start? You can certainly call them out on that, but that might be better maybe as something to do later on in the debate or maybe as a part of a larger response. But you have to keep in mind, how do I know if my arguments are good or strong? Do they speak to this central issue of the debate? Do they speak to this big, resounding issue in the debate? And then those things have to be dealt with. Those most important things have to be dealt with pretty early on is what Luke is saying. You know, there's a, a counter idea to this, which is you want to clean up the mess of the small things <coughs> first, and then at the end, so that you can do the proper damage control and really stick in the mind of the judge, you do the extremely strong point at the end, so that you end on that solid note, which is right. It's impossible to say, because each debate is different. What I want you to be aware of is that you have the control to make these judgments yourself, you and your partner in the debate. You don't have to follow something. Just because you saw some great speaker do the organization this way, if you tried to do it that way every time, you'll probably lose a lot of debates. You have to be flexible. You have to be making these decisions for yourself in the context of the debate that you're in. And that's how you become a great debater, is knowing when to change, how to alter it, and when to make those kind of decisions. That's how you become really good. It's not a formula. It's a thought process of how do I know where to put something and how do I know where to move it around. So transitions and decisions about importance. Those are the most important things about the content of the speech. Right? And monitoring your time, it's really impossible for me to give you a really good way of doing it, but I always use just one piece of paper just for my speech because I know that I will get distracted. I'll get disorganized, I'll get flustered, that kind of thing. It's sort of a, don't be afraid to use a lot of paper if it helps you stay organized. Right? It's good to conserve paper, it's good to conserve resources in your daily life, but in debate you want to make sure that you, um, you know, kill as many trees as necessary to stay on target with your, uh, you can make up for it later, you know, recycle something or whatever, or maybe, you know, write on the backs of envelopes. And so I had a very environmentally conscious professor university who delivered all of his lectures from like the back of his electric bill and phone bill. Like you could see what these things and you were talking, I'm like, why are you why are you doing this? He's like, well I think it's just such a waste of paper that I get all these envelopes and I throw them away, so I use them to do all my lectures on. So he had a stack of what looked like his bills from home that he was gonna do during the class. But he had his lecture written on the back of the bills. So he's like every so little things like that if you feel bad about it. But I I don't know, I think it's perfectly fine to use a ton of it when you're trying to stay organized in the debate and stay focused. So make up for it in other areas. So the final part of the well-organized speech is the conclusion. How do you get out of the speech? How do you get out of it safely without hurting yourself or others? And this is where I say you want to think about a good speech as like a date. Right? It's like going on a date. On a date, you usually you know, go and pick the person up. You take them, you do things, and then you take them home. Right? You want to drop them off reasonably close to where you pick them up, if not exactly where you pick them up. Right? You don't want to just be like, all right, that was a great movie. Uh, see ya and just leave, and just leave them there. Like, ah, uh, <laughs> so bye. <laughs> but we do this all the time in our speeches, right? We don't remind them, you know, why they wanted to go out with us in the first place. We don't remind them, you know, we don't bring any closure to the evening. We don't bring any closure to the speech. So the very first thing you have to do in the conclusion is go back to that introduction, that attention getter, and mention that again. Go back to that to make it a full circle, right? So like in the West, in Western thought, we recognize progress, and I don't really have a, a board here, so I'll burn a little paper to make this point. Okay, in the West, we sort of recognize progress like this, right? A line that has a fixed starting point, and we move along towards some kind of a conclusion or a goal. Right? This is how we think about it, or you could think about it like stairs, or moving up, but it's in a linear sort of direction. In Eastern thought, we don't think about progress like this at all. 
but they think of it like a circle. Where we started here and we took the journey and we ended up fairly close to where we were, but we're better off for having gone through all of this. So this is more of the Eastern way of thinking about progress in a very broad brush terms. There's many different ways of thinking about it. But this circle, right? This is the way you want to think about a good debate speech. Is it starts somewhere and it goes around, <coughs> and when it ends, it ends somewhere close to where you started. So you go back to that introduction, back to that thesis, mention it again, remind the audience why it was that they wanted to pay attention to you in the first place. Go back to that mention. <coughs> this is also what I was talking about the container, the container for the speech. This is also a good model for the speech as well because within the circle here, you've given them a nice container. If you just move linearly through the speech, there's really nowhere to hold all those things that you keep ha handing them. You're just making progress and they might forget something over here that's important by the time you get here. If it's like this, everything is easily seen from any other point on the, during the process. So it's sort of a large <coughs> visual metaphor for thinking about what a good speech looks like. So return to that attention getter, drop them off pretty close to where you picked them up. Right? That's what I'd say first. The second thing is remind the judge, remind the judges, remind the audience of what your line is again, that thesis, that main idea. Remind them that. You know, you hear conclusions are always happening all the time where they say, what did I tell, what have we told you today? We've told you da 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 da. We've told you da 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 da. So please, I beg you to vote opposition. Right? It's not necessarily the best conclusion, but the basic sorts of elements are there. I think I would avoid something like, you know, what have I told you today? I mean, you hear that you're going to hear this a lot. You hear it a lot in the practices. You hear it a lot. You see a lot of people do it. But I think it would be better if you refer back to that unique <coughs> way that you got attention into the speech. If you refer back to it in a specific, that unique way of how you got attention, then it differentiates you from the other people. Secondly, if you remind everybody of your team line again, what you stand for, what you and your partner stand for, what do you contribute to the debate, that's very important. And then the final thing in the conclusion you want to do is review the general flags of the arguments that you've covered. Right? Now, how do we end it? Now that we've done those things, how do you get out safely? What do you think about it when you see people speak and they're near the end of their speech and they're saying things like, and so, uh, with all these things in mind, uh, <coughs> we would like you to vote for the opposition. <coughs> right? What do you think about it? You've seen people do this before, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Why not? Because um, it, it, yeah, it actually spoils the whole the whole speech. Because at the end, what well, I think you should like really the last phrase should be like sort of a punchline that stays in your mind. And it's something that's the last thing you say is gonna is gonna be the thing that the audience remembers. Mm -hmm. That's right. Maybe, maybe saying vote for the opposition is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. you can say it, but it won't make it something more substantial. Mm -hmm. I mean, how long does it say to, to take to say and please vote for the opposition, something like that? I mean, we kind of know you're going to say it. It's maybe eight or ten seconds, but maybe you could do something. Maybe a little bit more creative, yeah. or something that really catches, yeah. like a real hook. You could do something more than that. Just because everyone else is doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. What is good about it is the recognition of that important part of the speech, which is that closure to indicate this is the end. There's nothing worse than a speech that drags on and on and on because the person doesn't know how to end it. They stop, and it doesn't seem like that they've brought it to a close. Your tone, the way you conduct yourself, all these things indicate the audience are bringing it to a close. So you say, with these things in mind, we see that the model being proposed is unacceptable, and we hope that you will not support it. Right? Now, that's a very solid way of closing that indicates that it doesn't do any of those. I think it's obvious if you just say, like, vote for the opposition, because you're not going to say the contrary. Right. Yeah. Like, we are expecting it. Yeah, but it's, it's sort of bad when people don't do that and they don't know other ways of closing, because then they'll say, and so, you know, these are why the arguments are, are sort of bad. And then everyone's like, oh, is it over? And then people kind of start to knock. But then the person has already gotten nervous that maybe, oh, I forgot something. <laughs> I still have a few seconds left. Maybe I should talk some more. Oh, and then there's also this other argument, da 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 And so we're like, oh, they're not done. Okay. And they sit back. And then the person's like, da 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 Oh, they're done. Uh, oh. Well, uh, and you get to this endless sort of cycle. You're like, are they done or not? <coughs> it's best to just be done. It makes you look very confident that you've covered everything, whether you have or not sort of beside the point, but you always want to look confident that you've covered everything, that you've made the most solid case. So and that's why you support you know, whatever your team name might be, or that's why you support the idea of freedom over security. Something like that is a really powerful way, a very strong way to end. And it closes things down and also seals the package. 
So now you can give this really nice gift rack box of ideas over to the judge. Thank you. Right? So getting out of the speech is really difficult. So you want to think of ways of doing that that might be more creative to set yourself apart. Every little thing matters. If you just do what you see the top teams doing, it might not be the best because then you're not really you know, distinguished. You want to look at the principles behind what they're doing and say, oh, that's great. But you don't want to, you don't want to make the mistake of substituting effect for cause or symptom for disease. Right? And say, oh, okay, and then you just perform the symptom that you see them doing, thinking that's why they're good. That's not really why they're good. Right? Everyone makes mistakes. But the idea, the principle of getting out of it soundly is very important. So that's the conclusion. Remind them of the, that, that attention getter. Bring them back to that reason why they want if it was funny or witty or whatever it was. Bring them back to that question. Restate your team line. Review what you've done and get out with a bang, a real solid sort of it. That's a nice conclusion. Every speech you give, whether you're a whip, whether you're opening opposition, should have a structure like this. There are specific considerations for the job that you're doing, which we'll cover in another session, but you want to keep these general principles in mind for any speech that you give. I think they're very important. So, are there any questions? Smoke time. All right, it is smoke time, coffee time, break time.